Hey, 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 potheads and political junkies. Welcome to a special edition of Cannabis Culture News with Maria Soska sitting in for Jeremiah Vandermeer. I'm here with the curator of the Herb Museum, uh, David Melmo Levine. Hello, Pot TV viewers. I guess you're standing in for him right now. You'll be sitting in for him later on when we're in the museum. We have chairs. That's right. Well, oh, oh, I went black. Uh, I don't know. Can you guys see me out there? No, it just went black. It's choppy and black. Okay. Oh, no, there you we're are. Back. We're back. So we're having some problems. I think we'll get better when we move inside. So uh, the reason we're doing this is because the other show got eaten by live stream. And uh, it was, uh, it was, I, I was so moved by uh, going through the museum. Uh, and uh, that I wanted to do it again. And so, uh, oh, we're black again. Let's, let's, let's just uh, move right. on in. They might still be hearing us unless this is being recorded. Right, okay. So, move on in closer to the. Uh, the action. Here we go, closer to the uh, modem. Yeah, I just or wanted to show here. people the, the door so they so. know where the museum is and how That's to find right. it. Uh, it's at uh, 303 West Tastings in the. Uh, second floor of the BC Marijuana Party, and now we are standing in the room of the invisible drugs, the drugs that people take every day and don't even realize they're taking drugs. For example, behind me, we have the wall of tobacco. We can learn about the ancient Mexo Mexo-American, Central American, Mexican drug tobacco. And, uh, then over here, yeah, good night, night, Tegan. Um, then over here is the wall of cacao or the chocolate tree. Have you ever seen a chocolate tree, Maria? No, I have not seen a chocolate tree. Here, point it up there. I've seen chocolate rabbits. See the chocolate tree. That's the oh, tree wow. that the chocolate pods grow on. The chocolate pods have the beans or seeds in them, and they get dried out and then crushed and heated and pressed and turned into that lovely chocolate everyone enjoys. And then over here, we've got the history of the coffee bean, how it came from Ethiopia mm -hmm. and it's now grown all over the equatorial world in South America and Asia and uh, Africa. Mm. So pretty much everywhere. And then, uh, These are all prehistorical times. Oh, yeah. Basically. Well, prehistory. No, uh, actually not. Um, coffee beans come from around the 600s or 700s AD, so post history. And uh, the uh, it could be argued that maybe chocolate came from the Olmec civilization, and they were just kind of on the edge of recording their own history, mostly in big stone heads, right? So, yeah, mm -hmm. kind of free history chocolate is that. There's like etchings from uh, AD 500 there into uh, uh, a carved boss, and the Mayans decorated a lot of their uh, temples and their, um, you know, living quarters with images of cacao and hot chocolate. Um, let's see, tobacco, again, the Mayans, same same deal. And the Miztec, they decorated their, their paraphernalia, their vases, their temples with images of smoking tobacco. Tea, tea is really old. Tea is ancient. It goes back a long time. There's actually trees, tea trees, that are 2,700 years old and still living, mm. and uh, so they the tea. I mean, tea goes back so far. They got a couple of gods of tea, the god and goddesses of tea. Kuan Yin, uh, the goddess of Mer mercy, mm. and she has black tea and oolong tea is associated with her. And so this uh, this looks like uh, you've got uh, products. Oh yeah. Here. Well, this, 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 these, like, the, these aren't for sale. These are no, artifacts. No, no, but these are art. Yeah, artifacts. We do have some uh, products. Of, of the invisible them. drugs in this room. Yeah, we do have a couple uh, products for sale. We have chocolates with uh, aphrodisiac 
infusion in them oh. so you can <laughs> make sweet, sweet love to your partner or partners mm -hmm. or to yourself. Mm -hmm. But it just it enhances the performance. Yohimbi inside the chocolate makes everything just swell. The Damiana mimics testosterone and makes you feel like a 14 year old schoolboy again. Assuming you were one at one time or another. <laughs> but yeah, the chocolate is awesome because it's like six drugs. There's there's cannabis uh, like um, molecules in there called anandamide, which is what your body also produces. There's the theobromine, caffeine, sugar, those are all stimulants. And there's uh, phenylethylamine, which makes you feel like you're falling in love, getting a big promotion. The chocolate is like awesome. It's like so many drugs. Some of them are just like marijuana. Some of them are even, you know, unique, like the uh -huh. phenylethylamine. Uh, yeah. Oh wow! This this room is amazing, and wow, I could spend an hour in here just just just, just reading the wall. Just, just just this particular room. So soaking it up, learn. Well, there's the nice killer whale here. Yeah, and into the next room, and this is door. This is the uh, the art like gallery. gallery. The art gallery and gift shop and gift shop where we try to raise revenue to keep the herb museum alive and thriving and going. And, yeah, uh, yeah, every and business needs to survive. We need to survive. We need we need a budget for other artifacts to keep accumulating artifacts where we, you know, we grow as a museum. And mm -hmm. so, yes, if you look around here, we got lots of different artists, local artists. Uh, Bob High, there's some Bob High on the wall. There's some Ken Foster. There's some Megan Allard. There's some uh, Dave Douglas and John Walkus, the carver, and uh, various other people represented on the art gallery wall so yeah uh, some of the prices are insane there's the dotty box right there we got uh, some very cheap art and then we got some very expensive art and then we got everything in between and uh, we have some prints too we have uh, things that we just you know put on uh, on a foam board kind of blown up things the color ones are ten bucks the black and white are five we have these postcards which range from 50 cents each to two bucks and we have some cards as well ranging from three to six dollars so you can mail somebody some drug piece images some some herbal history some dubich dignity and send those messages around the world and we have some of these postcards frame well too they look really good on your wall that's awesome. Yeah. And, uh, well, we're also going <coughs> to, uh, if you don't mind, we're going to run a clip from 420. No, I don't mind at all. Uh, just because we're trying to recreate the entire show. Yeah. So, 420 uh, was epic. It was, it was excellent. And it was first, massive. First of all, looks like we're going to look at, uh, the global news slant. Sounds good. They had a helicopter up there, didn't they? That's right. Woohoo! You can really get clip. high. So uh, in, enjoy, enjoy 420, and uh, we'll be back with uh, the next couple of rooms. Twenty past four, the collective high point at Vancouver's massive yearly marijuana celebration. He's almost got it. He's almost got it. He's almost, there it goes. And oh, holy! Somebody catch him! It's just over. In a city where the enforcement of marijuana laws is assumed to be relaxed, the criminal code has been completely forgotten for an afternoon. That man is here at 420 because he smokes weed every day to fight stress when dealing with criminals. That man has nothing negative to say about marijuana. Even though we know it is a celebration, it's a party for a lot of people, it's also a reminder that it is illegal. This is a protest because it's illegal. And if we want to be able to be free to do this at any time, then we need to work to change the laws. And this appears to be Vancouver's largest 420 to date. Without knowing the numbers today, uh, this is the biggest. But that's just me saying, uh, you know, by looking at the crowd. But yeah, it's, it's big. <laughs> Perhaps it's growing mainstream support, but great weather on a professional development day for students doesn't hurt. Five bucks, six good, ten. Good. A bake sale at the art gallery reveals an entrepreneurial spirit. Really? We've already made quite a bit. We've yeah. been here for a couple hours. We've probably already broke 200, so. No, more than that. At least, yeah. yeah. Oh, they're pretty strong. There's a half gram of hash in each one. I'm going to eat them all, and I'm going to smoke all of this. I have one. <laughs> 
next month. The open-air cannabis market does brisk business. Accessories are easy to come by. Hot dogs and candy available for those impulse buyers. We got a we got a the police don't bust anybody and actually walk through the lot and give us the thumbs up and smile at us. It's seen as evidence of slow and steady change that they're confident will result in eventual legalization. Absolutely. I don't think it's even that far away. I think it's coming very soon. Hey everybody, and we're back, and I'm really sorry about the lag. Uh, hopefully the recorded version will be lag-free. That, that tends to be what happens. We're shooting from a laptop, and our internet connection isn't that great. But uh, we're doing our best here, and we're back with David Malone-Levine, and the curator of the uh, Herb Museum here at 303 West Hastings on the second floor. And, uh, well, I'll go back to you, David. Welcome to room number three of the Herb Museum. We are in the room of the natural aids, the non-psychoactive botanicals, the plants that heal your body. And over there, we have the synthetic display of the non-botanical drugs. Fit to serve as kind of a comparison. Some of them are really cool. Most of them are just poisonous bullshit. So, in this display case, you can see all these old medicine bottles, which incidentally enough, most of, of which were acquired through eBay. So if you want to set up your own museum, eBay, a curator's wet dream. These bottles, a lot of these uh, old botanical medicine bottles, anything with a cork is about a hundred years old, give or take. And these bottles contain uh, plant essences that we normally associate with foods. For example, we got capsicum, which is pepper. We got blueberry and orange. We got cinnamon, we got yam, we got cherry, we got ginger. All these uh, uh, foods are, when you get the extract of them, they're terpenes, they're volatile oils, uh, and they're essences, they, they become medicine. You know, in wise hands, poison is medicine. And I guess in wise hands, food is medicine, too. When you Google, say, something like a, a potato, a tomato, or onion, and you, you go to Wikipedia, you can find out... Uh, each of these plants also has medicinal uses. So, Google it, because uh, the world of nature is there to help you. Um, if I may, just for a second, uh, point a few things out to our viewers. Uh, in here we have the synthetics, we have a little Bayer section there, they're kind of the worst corporation on planet Earth with <coughs> the worst track record of human rights abuses and, and criminal offenses. For example, everything that uh, the Nazis did in World War II, Bayer did back in World War I, including uh, forced labor, gas warfare, uh, the uh, Führer principle, the strongman principle, anti-Semitism, and uh, national socialism. Yeah, uh, in 1916, two years before anyone, had, uh, well, I guess four years before anyone had heard of Hitler, two years before Hitler got involved in politics, they were pushing a national socialism. And so, yeah, that's Bayer. And incidentally, uh, we also have a little bottle of iodoform, which in 1907 Hitler's doctor gave too much of to Hitler's mother and killed her with. And instead of Hitler hating on the pharmaceutical industry for creating that poison or hating on the doctors for prescribing it, he decided to hate on the fact this doctor was Jewish. And that's kind of maybe possibly where you get his... Uh, Violent anti Certainly likely to con have contributed, contributed to something. To yeah. His mom was like the only woman who was ever nice to him in his life, the only place he got affection from. So, yeah, mm -hmm. there might have been some psychology I guess, problems. I guess, I guess only, only he will know for sure. Only he will know for sure. <laughs> but, yeah, but, uh, it, it, it's, it's it, seems, it seems pretty likely. The spin off from these, these, uh, a lot of these poisons, a lot of this harsh chemical synthetic patented medicines uh, can can only be guessed at, but um, here's a bottle of uh, um, sulfanilamide, an elixir of which in 1936 killed uh, over 130 people, and they came up with a safety and efficacy test that now all drugs have to pass, including, say, cannabis in order to be legalized. you got to spend $200 million, kill a million rats just to test it out. Incidentally, uh, thalidomide, which is uh, what caused the birth defects in the 60s, uh, doesn't cause birth defects in rats. So a lot of these oh. safety and efficacy tests are really just 
Really? A uh, way to have an economic hurdle to well, prevent uh, plants to compete. Pack still causes birth defects yeah. uh, in, the, in the O's. <laughs> In the O's? I guess uh, in the last 10 years, there's there's a class action lawsuit oh, against yeah. Paxil for women having birth defects, so we're just repeating history, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, uh, we have a huge history with all these herbs, that we can just kind of look them up in books that we haven't bothered burning, yet. and we can find out what the safety and efficacy of each herb is. Blank, that uh, it, it does happen sometimes oh, because okay. of the internet connection. Right. So but, oh wait. Okay, yeah, we're it looks like uh, we're still rocking. Every, is everything uh, happening there still? Okay, we'll just continue it. We'll, we'll just continue. continue. The last the last uh, text message was I love DM. Oh so. good. <laughs> that's a good sign. So yeah, so the, that's our synthetic display. There's a couple of synthetics in there. And, and here uh, we have. The fabulous room of the psychoactive botanicals, the plants that mess up your mind and affect your emotions and your senses, um, mm. your uh, your sensory perceptions. Your um, it's hard to define psychoactive botanicals. They're psychoactive. They're mind related, mind active. Uh, so oh yeah, they're tricky. They're tricky. And so here, let's go right to the marijuana section, the hashish section. The cannabis mm -hmm. section, because it is pot TV we're, we're watching mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. This is the coolest uh, artifact in the entire museum. It's a uh, woodcut from David Candell from 1565, a German herbal from 1565, hand colored, genuine article. And yeah, that's, you know, about 450 years old. And I don't know how to read Old German or Middle German. But uh, if you do, come on down here and tell me what it says. Uh, <laughs> here we have a actually a herbal written in English from 1722, and it recommends cannabis as an aphrodisiac. I guess any plant that makes a minute feel like an hour is going to be handy when stretching out sensations that you totally enjoy, like mm -hmm. an ice cream cone, watching a movie you like, mm -hmm. anything you really enjoy doing. Cannabis and its time flow effects are really good for. Um, oh yeah, there's a little gold coin, kind of tiny. It's back down there, but you, we blew it up and put it on the wall so you could see what it it looked like. This is a Scythian gold coin from almost 2,000 years ago, the circa the first to third century A.D. And it's Shiva, the forearm Shiva, see those are his arms, and he's placing something on an altar there, like an incense altar. So we assume it's some sort of plant resin, Shiva being the god of cannabis, uh, we suspect. And because the, these guys are called the Scythians, or the Kushans, and this is where we get the word Kush from when we're smoking the Kush, it means the mountain range between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And cannabis indica means cannabis bred in India. And cannabis bred in India might very well be from these Kush mountains, because back when Pakistan was India, that was part of India too. So um, these Scythians, the very first historian Herodotus said that uh, these Scythians would have great big parties where they would hotbox, uh, kind of a steam bath, and throw buds on the, the the hot rocks and howl with pleasure after coming out of there. So these these Scythians, these horsemen of Asia, that kind of roamed around all of Asia and took with them these seeds and traded them and uh, really popularized, spread cannabis around from its original home in Central Asia. Um, yeah, these Scythians, uh, they worshipped cannabis. It was holy to them and they worshipped Shiva as the god of cannabis and they were totally into it and it was a big thing for them. So it's not like humans discovered cannabis in uh, the 60s. Uh, this has been going in and out of style and has been a big thing for many people uh, for centuries, millennia, really. Um, yeah, because Herodotus, uh, Herodotus, Herodotus uh, wrote in the 400 BC, so definitely millennia. Oh, over here, check this out. We have a number of different things. These are all old cannabis medicine bottles. 
again, anything with a cork in it, about 100 years old, give or take. They really uh, entered into the economy in the uh, 1850s. And by the 1880s, even Vancouver, you could go to a botanical druggist and get it off the shelf there. And it was used for uh, depression, stress, uh, sedation, shrinking corns, for coughs and colds, uh, for uh, all sorts of things, but uh, a nerve pain, pain as well. But um, yeah, the uh, <sighs> Emily Murphy and her mm -hmm. racist views um, mm -hmm. thought that you know if white women, you know, use cannabis, green looks like. But white white women. Yeah, I think it's just the. It's just the screen. Uh, if white the women screen use screen. cannabis, they'll sleep with dark skinned men and they'll be big problems. Yeah, I think. Yeah. That was the reason. Yeah, they're. Uh, well, that was. That was kind of the excuse. I guess the mm -hmm. reason was that um, the industrialists who ran the world at the time, the big oil companies, the big chemical companies like DuPont, Rockefeller, Standard Oil, they didn't want to compete with the farmer. So they used their political influence, mm. the senators and governors that they had, to pass legislation to outlaw the natural to monopolize the synthetic. But uh, one of uh, Rockefeller's most famous employees was a Canadian named William Lyon Mackenzie King, who went to work for the Rockefeller Foundation soon after he invented the drug war with his racist uh, anti-opium act in 1908. In 1907, there was this big riot, anti-Asian riot in Vancouver, and they were like, oh, these Asians, they come and they work twice as hard for half the pay, we can't compete, send them all back to Asia, now that the railroad is finished being built, and they threw rocks in all the windows of the Chinese merchants, and they tried to do the same thing in the, in the Japanese neighborhood, but those guys were samurais, and pulled out their swords, and the white guys kind of cowardly shrunk back and broke some more windows in the Chinese community. And William I. Mackenzie King was a then Deputy Minister of Labor. He was sent from Ottawa to Vancouver to assess the damage and figure out what to do. And he decided to blame the entire white racism thing on the opium dens, which were perfectly legal back in the 1800s, and paid taxes um, and employed lots of people and that these opium dens, white women and girls are going in there. And so, in 1908, he wrote, uh, The Need for the Suppression of the Opium Traffic in Canada, this report right, that we have here. And then, taking his own advice from that report, he wrote the Anti-Opium Act of 1908, which was racist on the surface because it would not allow uh, Chinese or Japanese people to sell opium, but allowed the white person to sell opium in their botanical drug stores because you couldn't be a pharmacist unless you could vote, and you couldn't vote if you were Asian. There were no Oriental pharmacists till the 50s in Canada. Mm. That's kind of the, the drug law, the first anti-drug law in Canada, the first national can, uh, drug prohibition law in Canada was uh, a white monopoly on opiates. Yeah, more and more uh, times I hear that it's being connected, the drug war, uh, to racism. Yeah. And it seems quite, quite obvious to me. It still is if you go to it still drugwarfacts.org. Absolutely. You can click on prison and race, little thing on the side there, and it shows that that uh, you know black people, people of color, are being uh, jailed uh, mm -hmm. way out of proportion to uh, their Absolutely. their population. Absolutely. Same thing with Canada and yeah. the Aboriginal people. Same mm -hmm. thing. It's why, yeah. Anyways, well let's let's uh, go on to the. Okay. I've been saying this was the opium wall. Yes, yeah, the see. opium wall. Poppies are great because they, you can grow them in your own backyard. You just don't want to let anybody catch anyone like law enforcement catching you uh, processing the opium. But you make a shallow cut in the pod. You have to use the hard, hard pods, not the the hairy little uh, soft pods, but the hard shell pods. You make a shallow cut, not a deep cut, or the milk will go inside. You make a shallow cut, and that white milk comes out. Uh, the next day, it dries and hardens, and you scrape it off, and that's opium. You can smoke that. That'll help you with pain, or you can eat it and it'll help you with pain uh, even longer. Uh, if you do it every day for three weeks, uh, you'll feel withdrawal symptoms when you stop. But if you just use it for occasional aches and pains, it's the aspirin you can grow in your backyard. It's, yeah, nature's medicine. Nature is It's medicine. just being vilified and 
Okay. It's extract. It, it could be deadly, certainly, but uh, you don't have to go that far. Well, yeah, you can use it wisely and to your benefit, or you can pay a pharmaceutical company to provide you something that's inferior and more expensive mm -hmm. and uh, equally, if, if not more dangerous. You just have to pay attention to dose on these things. They still use uh, opiates, uh, morphine, really, for babies who are dying of cancer. So. It's not like we, we avoid using opiates. We still use it in all sorts of things. No, but it's so dangerous, only doctors can only prescribe doctor it. Only doctors or a nurse can prescribe, prescribe it. And I'd say with, with infants, that's probably the case. But yes. uh, definitely an adult uh, growing poppies in the backyard using the leaves for tea or the opium. Should be up to their own discretion, absolutely. I, I think they, they're able to do that. And I think that uh, we should trust people to be that autonomous, at least verbally autonomous. I can't think of one plant that uh, anybody over the age of four should be prohibited from growing. No, me neither. Yeah. All right. Um, so, do you want to show another clip? And then yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I, the rest you of have the some, oops, you have some this people here. Yeah. So, but I hope that's okay. Oh, it's all good. Okay. All right, everybody. Uh, we're trying to repeat the show as best we can, but uh, you know how things are. Anyways. We will check out uh, the highlights of uh, Vancouver 420, and we'll see you back in about five minutes. Starting now. Sure. Have a great 420, everybody. Enjoy yourselves. Be safe. Much love to you all. And in those early days, we did not expect that one day we would have 15 to 20,000 people gathered here in peace and solidarity have jobs to do and we can understand that our job as people as citizens as Dana was saying is to change the law I'll tell you about my brother Mark he and I sold seeds to the world and mailed them to every country every town every city in the world we did that because Mark said let's overgrow the government but I gotta tell you folks that this would not be happening today if it was not for that man. We're here today experiencing a beautiful, beautiful day of freedom and light. The sun is shining because we are on the side of truth and justice and peace. The government would do us harm when we are harming no one. This event began here in Vancouver in the 90s and now it goes all over the world. It's really hard give away pot in a crowd this size without a stampede. So we've developed a system. Down there, there should be an easy path for our joint hander outers to walk. So if you want marijuana to be thrown at you, you gotta one, create a path. 20, 19. Oh, Canada, they're sick. 
sacred plant of peace. Thank you, Vancouver, very much. This is a major victory, ladies and gentlemen. It's 420 because of you guys. Keep doing it. Keep the faith. got back here before the clip quite ended um, but uh, we're going to continue our tour with uh, David Mama Levine the curator of their herb museum with the pipe shelf pipe okay, display shelf, pipe there's, display there's cabinet cabinet <laughs> yeah the gun rack turned pipe display we got uh, a chill in there an ancient chill in there we got uh, a replica and uh, photos of Shakespeare's pipes with, with the cannabis and cocaine uh, remnants in them. We got these pipe heads that serve to smoke kif, kif. Um, got uh, replicas of opium pipes here and old postcards with opium smoking in it, old pictures. And uh, some postcards from the 70s there and some other images of opium smoke. And then over here we've got these uh, some ancient hookahs and hookah parts and images of people smoking the hookah. Just kind of an ancient bubbler. And yeah, hookah pieces there too. And then in this cabinet over here, we got the wooden pipes, kind of African and Asian pipes made of wood for smoking. And then down here we have uh, the early vaporizers collection there and the ISO 2 which was a red oil making machine that blew up too often because the heating element was a light bulb and it was That's solvent right. everywhere. It's not a good idea, kids. They they advertised it for a couple of years in the back page of the High Times and Head Magazine, but yeah, you want to stay away from that sort of thing. Get get a degree in chemistry and, and work safely outdoors in a shed before you mess around with those. Yeah, I don't extracts. think they advertise them anymore, I think they yeah. withdrew at least a month ago. And I hear you're supposed to use N-butane, which is like a food safe butane for that sort of thing. So make sure you know what you're doing, otherwise you're going to poison. Okay. Uh, so am, I am, am I seeing things, or is that the hallucinogenic wall? You're seeing things, and it's Ooh. the hallucinogenic wall. You're seeing <laughs> the, the uh, display I made for the yeah, I am seeing things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're seeing things. But you're supposed to be seeing things. This is a herd museum. It's a little tricky. So yeah, we got uh, that that big one in the middle there is thorn apple or datura, and it's uh, the most powerful hallucinogen known to humankind. Some report three week highs. You can get high just from holding seeds inside a sweaty hand. It's really, really potent and very, very not for dangerous. the novice. <laughs> Not for the novice. Wait till you've done every mushroom that's hallucinogenic, every cactus that's hallucinogenic, 
and all the other ones too for like uh, the belladonnas and the other you know weird stuff you say stature for last it's really powerful but they make medicine out of it strangely enough they, they have these um, asthmador cigarettes or these other medicines people use in wise hands poison is medicine and in the right small doses these uh, hallucinogens have other use uh, over here we have magic mushrooms like the Amanita muscaria or fly agaric mushroom which uh, these ones are uh, picked locally and those ones down there there are some from Siberia that were available or are available at the urban shaman downstairs 307 West Station um, we got uh, Psilocybin essence, we got psilocybin mexican, we got psilocybin azurescence, and we got a Sandoz bottle of pharmaceutical grade psilocybin. So, your you know magic mushrooms from your drug company. Uh, and we have a Sandoz physician sample of LSD. A little this is what an LSD bottle looks like, kids. Uh, and it's sitting atop a, oh, October first, nineteen fifty three, McLean's magazine with the very first media mention of LSD anywhere in the mass media. My 24 hours, or no, my 12 hours as a madman by Sidney Katz. I mean, the second media mention of LSD, the Reader's Digest, January 1954 edition, and other various LSD publications, got Tim Leary's autograph. We got uh, this little red cap bottle there is a bottle of pharmaceutical grade DMT. Dimethyltryptamine. What I would say is uh, nature's uh, uh, safest and most enjoyable hallucinogen. Mm. If you don't mm. like the trip, it's over in 10 minutes. What's and many people report it to be enjoyable. What's, what's, what's its nickname? The Businessman's High? Businessman's Acid Trip. Yeah, it's uh, definitely, you know, when I took it uh, this one time, everything turned to liquid crystals. Very pleasant. I, I didn't have uh, too much burnout afterwards. I was just kind of mellow. Uh, yeah. EMP, and it's found in like over 160 plants and a couple of frogs. So it's everywhere. It's all around. It's acacia bark. Really, is it, if you lick a toad, uh, that's what you'll be. Got to be the right toad. You lick of the course, wrong toad, man. It's like you're eating the wrong mushroom. Well, you know, I, I would definitely not lick the wrong toad. I would take it to dinner first and make sure we had enough in common <laughs> before, oh, yeah. I, before it Get to know your it. toad before you start licking it. That's for sure. And uh, here we have some posters of absinthe. Bottles. Uh, and absinthe is for those. Absinthe is kind of like a, um, a kind of licoricey sort of weird liqueur which has wormwood in it, and the wormwood contains sujone, which is reportedly hallucinogenic. Uh, it's not really confirmed yet. There's debate over whether it's hallucinogenic or not, but you should try it out. Try everything once. And we have some old absinthe bottles uh, here. We have some, oh, one old one uh, from the ancient days, and then the rest are more modern. Um, and we have these are aphrodisiacs here. We got some uh, Damiana bottles, and we got a Yohimbe he bottle. Uh, the Yohimbe tree is a tree in Africa that uh, is really the world's most powerful uh, aphrodisiac. Makes everything just swell. Mm -hmm. And uh, Damiana. Bottle. That's what a full bottle of Damiana liqueur looks like. And that's what Damiana Bush looks like, and it mimics testosterone. It makes everything, makes everyone feel like a 14-year-old schoolboy again. And what does it do to women? Uh, it mimics testosterone, and makes them feel like a 14-year-old schoolboy for the oh, very so. first time. Ah, interesting. Yes, if you want to be uh, incredibly horny and make love all night long, and break all previous records. You don't need aphrodisiac for it, but they. Yeah. They don't hurt. They do help. Um, well, I can't imagine who would want to do that. I can't so. imagine who wants to do that. <laughs> it's kind of like you know, nature uh, is competing with uh, Pfizer for your your, your Viagra dollar, but uh, here they kindly put them in plants which are safer, cheaper, more effective. So we've slipped into the the wall of aphrodisiacs and yes, and cocoa and coca. Coca. Cocoa was out. So. out there with the chocolate tree. And uh, Coca is a bush. Coca-Cola. And Coca-Cola was named after uh, this uh, coca plant and the cola plant. Um, coca uh, was actually in 
the cocaine inside the coca plant was actually in Coca Cola from 1886 until 1903 or 1905, depending on which story you believe. But yeah, and they knew it. They definitely advertised the effects in the early ads. It relieves exhaustion. It's exhilarating and invigorating. It has the wonderful tonic properties of the wonderful coca plant. So uh, yeah, all these old ads definitely proved that they were they were pushing a stimulant on people and. They called it a soft drink, but it was, you know, it's a pretty powerful stimulant. Of course, it's not as powerful as caffeine, which mm -hmm. uh, has withdrawal symptoms that uh, coca, drinking coca beverages don't have. You get the headache when you stop drinking caffeine. Um, and and hmm. people like Thomas Edison, who invented all sorts of things that we use today, including the light bulb, uh, he used to like to invent after dinner. And he would drink this Vin Mariana, this Coke-infused wine. We have ads for the Vin Mariana here. Uh, and he used to drink that after dinner, and it was kind of a relaxant and a stimulant at the same time. And then he could stay up all night long and invent all the things we currently enjoy, our technology, thousands of things. And so, you know, you can use these Coca beverages, low-dose beverages, and chewing on coca leaves, much like the... Uh, Indians of the uh, Andes, the Akoji Indians, you could use them in low doses without hurting yourself. It's just when you put it in super concentrated form and snort it every day that you run into problems. So, um, yeah, I stopped fearing drugs when I started to learn about drugs and learn that they're just like tools in a toolkit. Just because you can bash in someone's head in with a hammer doesn't mean you should ban hammers. You should just teach people how to use hammers properly. And it's the same thing with all the drugs. You just need to teach people how to use them properly and they'll stop fearing them and start utilizing them to their benefit. Yes. So there's no good or bad drugs. It's just good or bad relationships with drugs. And this is kind of what we here at the Herb Museum are trying to teach the rest of the world. Well, yeah, certainly the, the war on drugs is, is uh, ludicrous and, and has robbed us not only of the, the use of these uh, drugs, but our history. Yeah. And uh, you know, who knows what our civilization would be like if we uh, were just happy and free uh, to do <laughs> what we want with whatever plant we wanted. I mean, it it doesn't sound so crazy. We uh, would all become. But you know, they're just plants after all. We would all so. become super shamans, totally <laughs> medically autonomous and in complete control of our lives. It'd be glorious. And maybe Wonderful. with medical autonomy. Uh, we would also get our political, sexual, economic, and other autonomies back too, and we would become truly undomesticated human yeah. beings uh, yeah. on the free-range uh, <coughs> human farm. Empowered and free. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, David, for for doing this tour again. Thank you, Mario. Yeah, for, not a uh, problem. I I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it as much as last time. Great. So uh, I think I will uh, end with a clip on, I'm not sure exactly what's on it, Mystery but clip. it has to do with the upcoming uh, Global Marijuana March. Terrific. And, See you all uh, there, May 5th. May 5th, and you're going to be uh, doing uh, the Vancouver version. That's right. We'll be uh, handing out some uh, party time, papers. What time are we starting there? We're starting at 2 o'clock at uh, the Art Gallery. We're marching at 3 and we'll probably arrive at the beach around 4, mm -hmm. and maybe at 4.20 we'll uh, kick back, relax, have a laugh, as the Beatles say. So we've been doing this for years and never yes. had any problems with the police. No, it's they smaller can... than 4.20, but it's definitely a worthwhile to come out. And, and a couple of cops to escort us down the street, but they <laughs> never they yeah. never messed with us really too much. They tried to arrest somebody uh, one, one year, and we hugged them, and they, the police backed off. So. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it's about that time to put your drinks down. Ich mach das alles nur auf Liebe zu. Guck, wie du fliegst nach diesem Zug. Du schöne grüne Wiese, du. Marihuana. Ich mach das alles nur auf Liebe zu. Yo, see?
Tito, where you at, man? Ich dreh mir ne grüne Chick, Chick, rote Augen, grüner Blick, Chick. Ich fühle nix, nix. Mir fehlt jede Übersicht. Ich weiß nicht, ob ich lebe. Ich glaub, ich schwebe irgendwo in der Atmosphäre leere. Ach, ich weiß nicht, was ich dreh. Noch einmal ziehen. Ich bleib heute liegen, auch wenn nichts mehr da ist. Egal, zur Not braucht der Teufel fliegen. Ich bin hier auf Wolke sieben, falls du mich suchst. Die Lunge schwarz wie der, der Hals voller Ruhe. Und ich denke, ich, ich denke nichts. Ich erkenne mich nicht. Sag mal, bewegen die Wände sich. Du fragst, wann endet es? Doch jetzt geht's erst los. Miese Brise, diese Brise in dem Bettchen und wo? Ich mach das alles nur aus Liebe zu. Ich mach das alles nur aus Liebe zu. Guck, wie du fliegst nach diesem Zug. Du schöne grüne Wiese, du.